Bismillahirrahmanirrahim. Wassalatu wassalamu ala nabiyya Muhammad wa ala alihi wa sahbihi ajma'in. Thank you very much for the invitation. I'm glad and delighted to be part of the keynote speakers. And uh, I'm happy to present one of our uh, best inventions that we have done so far, which is the Roslink protocol. It is a protocol for connected uh, ROS enabled robots and drones to the Internet of Things and the cloud. Okay, so the outline of uh, my presentation will be as follows. First of all, I'm going to make an introduction for robot operating system because the Roslink protocol is based on this uh, very important protocol. So I'm going to introduce why did I use ROS for my research in robotics. And I'm going to provide an overview about ROS, ROS1, and also the, the future generation version that is ROS2. I will also provide our contributions with the robot operating system and I will present the research and educational resources for those who would like to expand more their knowledge. So the second part of the presentation will be about the Roslink protocol, which is the protocol that we have designed to interconnect robots and drones over the Internet of Things and the cloud. So I'm going to present first the existing approaches that have inspired us. And uh, uh, I'm going to present the Roslink architecture, the different type of Roslink messages. And finally, we'll conclude with some demonstrations and real world applications that we have built around Roslink. Okay, first of all, let me give you an overview of Prince Sultan University. Probably most of you didn't hear about it, or maybe you have. So Prince Sultan University is the first private university in Saudi Arabia. It was established in um, uh, 1999. And uh, alhamdulillah, recently starting from um, 2019, we started to be like a research, uh, research-based university. So we have made complete transformation to our research bylaws and regulations uh, in order to increase our research productivity. And you ca as you can see here, starting from 2019, we have increased a lot in, in terms of publications. So in 2018, we have only less than 200 publications, 180. And this year, in 2021, we reached 910 nine, nine publications, which makes three, almost three publications per faculty. And this is actually, uh, we are almost number one or after cost in terms of publication per faculty in Saudi Arabia. We have made a lot of, uh, we have established seven, in, in the last three years, 17 research labs and groups in all different colleges. We have now seven colleges at the university. Uh, we've made like a five year strategic plan that has led to this transformation. Uh, in addition, we have uh, established a program to attract top researchers. And uh, we have some researchers that are uh, uh, highly cited researchers, they are in the top 1% in the web of science. We have 16 researchers that are listed in the top 2% globally, uh, according to Stanford University uh, uh, list that was uh, recently released in November uh, 2021. We have also received awards, uh, international awards. Uh, the last one is about the Cows Challenge. So we have been ranked first among uh, 1,300 teams participating in this award. And also we have uh, very good infrastructures for researchers. We have different type of researchers now, fully dedicated to research, starting from postdocs, senior researchers, research professors, research engineers, and research assistants. And we also welcome uh, postdoc. Uh, we have a postdoc program, so if there are some PhD graduates, they might be interested to apply to the postdoc program at Prince Sultan University. So if you would like to know more about the research at PSU, you can go to ric.psu.edu.sa for more information. So uh, about the Robotics and Internet of Things lab, it's, this is the lab that I am leading. Uh, it is the first lab established in Prince Sultan University in 2017. And uh, we started almost two or three people now. We have 15 dedicated researchers. We do uh, several, uh, we work on several research areas starting from artificial intelligence, uh, drone, uh, drone systems, mobile robots, Internet of Things, uh, cloud computing, uh, cybersecurity. Uh, so we have developed a lot of applications. This is, for example, vehicle identification, uh, automatic vehicle identification. We are able to identify the vehicle brand type and also license plate. We have made smart traffic analysis from drone images, palm counting, uh, photogrammetry. Uh, we provide also drone training for uh, people. We have participated in exhibitions. Uh, we are actually uh, inspiring all other labs in, in Prince Sultan University, uh, and uh, uh, we provide also workshops to the students uh, and several other activities. So this was just an overview about the university and the research lab. So about myself, I'm full, pro full professor in computer science 
in Princeton University, I'm also the director of the Research and Initiative Center, which is like uh, the administrative office of the research at the university, and I'm also the director of the Robotics and Internet of Things Lab. Okay, so in this talk, I'm going to talk about ROS and ROS Link, but first of all, why did I work with ROS? So basically, my research about robotics started in maybe uh, 2010, 2011, and at this time, uh, even before, it was 2009. And uh, as a computer scientist, working with robots uh, is probably not uh, much affordable because usually we don't have the background of mechanical engineer and electrical engineer to deal with low-level drivers for electrical components, for motors, for sensors. So I want to find like some way that would simplify all the low-level complexity in order for me as computer scientist to focus more on developing high-level software. Uh, because usually as computer scientists, we do not to, to program at low level like low level drivers in C and, and so on. So ROS was actually the solution to overcome all the underlying complexity of the hardware of the low level drivers and will allow you to uh, basically focus on developing your high level software and applications. So I'm going to explain this uh, all along the introduction to ROS. So, uh, and actually ROS can expand the users uh, and also the researchers that work around uh, the, um, uh, around robotics. Because uh, I know that many people would go for simulation, but it's actually, as a practitioner, uh, it will be much more interesting when you have developed a new solution, new algorithms, to implement them on real robots without dealing about the complexity of low-level drivers and underlying, uh, uh, underlying technical uh, issues. OK. so. Uh, let me just go you through my experience. Like uh, this is one of our first work when I uh, in 2010. So uh, in this work we have developed a path planning algorithm. So we have defi uh, defined this algorithm and we would like to validate this on a robot. So as you can see, we have implemented very simple proof of concept, and here we had to hard code all the different functionalities: the navigation, uh, the motion of the robot. Uh, at that time, Ross was uh, just at an early stage; we didn't use it, so. We had to program everything in C, and uh, at the end, you, you cannot do something very, very sophisticated. You barely can just demonstrate a proof of concept about the algorithm that you have used. It's not something that you can really uh, develop at a uh, larger scale. Okay, same thing, for example, here, uh, we wanted also to make collision avoidance. And I remember at that time, we have to send like specific signals to the left motors, to the right motors. If you want, for example, the robot to move straight, the left signal motor must be equal to the right signal motor, and if you want to rotate it, so you have to make the left higher than, than the right speed motor and so on. So it was not a very affordable way of programming. So uh, if we want to focus on high-level programming, uh, we cannot. We have to deal all the low-level complexity of the drivers, of, of the motors that we are using, of the camera that, uh, that is being implemented. So you have to have everything hard-coded. You have to have the right drivers. There is no abstraction. And this actually was a little bit difficult to work uh, in these conditions. Uh, also, uh, I remember we, we had a drone at that time. We wanted to develop like simple, simple applications on this drone. But again, it didn't use Rust. So we had to understand all the APIs that were developed in C++. Uh, it was not uh, an easy task. So this is why uh, I was looking for, for different type of framework platforms, and uh, ROS ha has been emerging at that time. So uh, if we look at the robot process cycle, basically it has three main phases. Any robot has three main phases. First of all, it has a perception module that is, will be sensing information from the environment. Like, for example, you can have a camera that will collect images. You can have uh, LiDAR or laser scanner that will detect obstacles either in 2D or 3D. And then when you collect this data, you're going to send this data to the processing module, which will process this data. And this is like the thinking phase. Here, it will process the data and then will provide you some actions. And these actions will be sent to the actuators. So the actuators could be, for example, in a mobile uh, robot can be the wheels. So we will send, uh, uh, for example, velocity commands for the robot to move or we send, for example, some signals to uh, the servo motors for a robotic arm to move. Uh, so this is the chain of any robot, any robot, whether it is mobile, whether it is drone, whether it is a uh, robotic arm or any other type of robot. So why ROS? So ROS here, it provides an abstraction layer 
that will allow you to make abstraction to the sensing phase and to the actuation phase. What does it mean? So for example, if you use particular camera, in ROS, you don't need to care about which driver to use for this camera. It's completely agnostic. So you will only focus on the stream coming from, the day, from, from that camera. Because ROS inherently implements all the different drivers uh, for uh, different type of cameras. So as long as you, send, uh, as long as you start the, the, the program that runs the camera, you will be able to easily, and I will show you later on how we can do this, uh, easily subscribe to the stream of data coming from that camera. For example, you can easily get the image and then process the image, for example, here in, in the think phase, and then uh, you, can, you can generate any action. So even the actions here, for example, sending velocity command to the robots, it will be done in an abstract way. Instead of checking which type of motors are you using, which kind of driver you have to use, no, it will make an abstraction to all of this. You will just need to deal with very simple, what we call topic, and type of messages that is standard. So standard for any kind of robot. I mean, if you use, for example, a mobile robot or if you use a drone, in any case, you are going to, to send a twist message. And this twist message will have uh, a linear velocity component, an angular velocity component, which will allow the robot to move in transitional direction or in rotational direction. So ROS is like a framework that will make abstraction to anything related to sensors and anything related to actuators and will help you focus on the logic of your application. Even it has a collection of libraries, for example, for, doing, uh, for building a map using SLAM, for making navigation going from one point to another, for sending velocity commands to the robot, everything is, is done in a standard way. And this will allow you even to develop the same program for different type of cameras, for different type of motors, for different type of robots in a very abstract and convenient way. So let's look, let's take the example of self-driving car. Self-driving car, for example, if you want to develop, it's a very complex, uh, it's a very complex application. It will require a perception module, as already mentioned. You need to have uh, 3D LIDARs, you need to have cameras in the front, you need to have sensors in the back in order to sense all the environment. Okay, uh, also all this information has to be sent to a processing module in order to process all of them. You need to have a way on how these different perceptions and actuation, uh, actuation uh, devices communicate with each other. So for example, how I'm going to con consume the data coming from the LiDAR, or how I'm going to consume, for example, images coming from the camera uh, in order to process them. So there should be like a network that will connect all these different devices together. Uh, also, you may want to implement some AI algorithms. Okay, so the, the benefit of using ROS is that it provides you all these type of libraries. They are uh, cutting edge libraries that are proven to be efficient. Uh, they are based on state of the art algorithms. They are provided all in the ROS framework. They can be actually used in a very uh, convenient and standard manner. So, uh, and this actually makes uh, ROS like a pioneer framework for developing nowadays robotic and drone applications. So just to give you a little bit of information about the ROS impact, uh, this is image is uh, taken from uh, download.ros.org. It shows the distribution of users around the world. So you can, ROS, you can see that ROS is almost used everywhere with a big concentration in the US and also in China. Uh, also in Japan, in India, in Germany, in South Korea, in India. And per month, there is around 2 million page view per month in, uh, in the ROS website. And there is uh, around uh, 120,000 new users per month for uh, as ROS users. You can see also here uh, in this uh, picture uh, the, uh, the overall traffic to ROS sites. It's... Uh, always increasing. Okay, so here it's, this is the forum for uh, uh, frequently asked questions about ROS. This is the uh, wiki.ros.org. This is the main website, as you can see. So the number of users is uh, always increasing with, with, with the years, with time. So now, what is ROS? So we can, we can define ROS as a middleware. Uh, it's a middleware that makes abstraction to the underlying hardware, uh, hardware layers and its drivers, and will let you focus on developing high-level applications for any kind of robots. So ROS has started basically from the early project in 2000 that, that was called 
player stage project, and then it was uh, it was funded as a project by Willow Garage in 2007, and the first version of Rust was released in 2010. And then there, are, there has been ve many versions. So the latest version uh, is Rust Noetic. Uh, this Rust Melodic, just uh, the previous one. And uh, you can see uh, here uh, it has gone through several versions. Now this is in what concerns Rust 1. And basically every version is named uh, on behalf of a turtle name. All, all of these are turtle uh, names. This is why here the logos are all turtles. Okay, now uh, this, uh, this, is, uh, this picture represents the Rust distribution over time. It was from uh, 2020. And as you can see here, so let me just explain you. These are the different Rust 1 version, and these are the different Rust 2 versions here. So one observation is last year, in 2020, most of the users are using Rust 1, whereas very little users are using Rust 2. This is just the proportion of Rust 2 users. Now, if you see the updated chart of 2021, you can see the number of ROS2 users. It has exponentially increased. And this is because ROS2 is going to change to replace uh, fundamentally ROS1 by 2023. Uh, I think still ROS1 is going to live a little bit longer. But now, considering that ROS2 is becoming more and more mature, it, it, is, be, uh, it is replacing more and more the first version of Rust, and I'm going to tell you what are the benefits of Rust 2 as compared to Rust 1. Now, uh, if you see here, uh, for example, here we have Andigo. It, it has been used for a very long time, then Kinetic, and then Melodic. So you can see that these versions, Andigo, Kinetic, and Melodic, are, have long time support, or what we call LTS versions. It means they are supported for at least five years. These versions that are used for just a little bit, like for example, Jade, Lunar uh, and uh, uh, Groovy here because they are not long time support. So basically, if you use Rust, it's better that you use the long time support version so you don't, because usually they, they, they will support, the Rust community will support it for at least five years. The non LTS versions will be supported almost for one year or maybe two, uh, I don't remember exactly. Okay, so for the Rust 1 architecture, it's basically on, uh, it's based on the Node concept. So a node basically is just a program, a program that you can write in Python or you can write in uh, C uh, or C++. So these programs will uh, communicate with each other, but every program, when it starts, first of all, it has to communicate with what we call the ROS master. The ROS master is the central node in ROS, and it is the first node that we need to start in order, for, uh, in order to be able to work with other nodes. So the, uh, a node one, when it wakes up, it will contact the ROS master, same thing for node two, and then the ROS master is going to establish the connection between these two nodes. Also ROS, it, has, it, it is basically developed for Linux environment, and it's for Ubuntu. And uh, it uses TCP and UDP as transport protocol to communicate between these different nodes. So it will establish like a local network on the machine uh, and can exchange messages based on the TCP protocol or the UDP protocol, which is here TCP ROS and UDP ROS. And it defined client libraries in Python language, which is called RustPy, or in C++, which is called RustCPP. And these libraries, they use several uh, libraries, like, for example, for building a map, for computer vision, they use OpenCV. Uh, for building a map, for example, they use uh, Gmapping. They have some uh, other libraries for navigation and for perception and so on. So all these libraries are defined in as uh, C++ or Python uh, wrapper layers. So let me give you a very brief uh, example on how uh, the ROS ecosystem works. So the first thing that you need to start is the ROS core. This is what we call the master. It's the first node that you need to start. And then imagine that you'd like to start a robot. For example, here, this is a robot that, that you would like to start. So it's another node. It's called turtle seam node, for example. And when this node wakes up, it will just try to connect to this ROS master. So the ROS master will have an IP address, which is the same as here. Uh, this node is going to connect to the IP address on this port number, and uh, it will register itself so that it will be recognized. Okay, so this node, for example, it will say, I am 
here. I am called turtle seam. Uh, I am waiting velocity messages to move on this topic, turtle one slash cm develop. It means command velocity. And the type of message that I look for is twist message. So twist message is the standard message in ROS that allows to send velocity commands. And it has two components, linear to move forward or backward, and angular to rotate left and right. So on the other hand, if I want to make this robot move, I need to start another node. And this node will be called here, for example, teleop. And you will be able to uh, press arrows in a keyboard in order to send, for example, if you, if you press the up arrow, the robot is going to move forward. If you press the down arrow, the robot is going to move backward and so on. And here, uh, so it will register to the ROS master. And it will say, I am tur teleop turtle. I publish uh, velocity commands on this topic. And I use the twist message also to publish the velocity commands. So in this case, when these two robots register in the ROS core, so they will, they will start exchanging messages. So this one will publish velocity message to this one. And once this one receives the velocity message, it will start to move accordingly, as you can see here in the chart. So let me show you here a real demonstration about the ROS ecosystem. First of all, as already mentioned, we need to start the ROS core. So ROS core now, it's started. It is waiting for other nodes to start. And here, I'm going to start the turtle seam node, as you can see. And this is going to start our simulated robot. It's a simple robot. No, it's, now, it's not moving. It's still waiting to, uh, for other uh, nodes to send velocity commands. And OK, and now I'm going to start the second node, which is called the turtle teleop key. And this will allow to send velocity commands using the keyboard. So now let's look what we have in our ecosystem. If I want to look at the number list of nodes, we can use the command ROS node list. So here it will say you have two nodes, one that is called turtle seam, which is this node here, and another one that is called teleop turtle, which is this node here. OK, so ROS allows you to know what are the different nodes that are available in your system. Now, if you want to see the list of topics, so you can think about the topic as a channel, as a communication channel. OK, so here, these two nodes are going to use one channel that is called turtle one cmd -Vel. So this channel allows to send velocity commands from, sorry, uh, it will allow to send velocity commands from uh, this node to this node. And now we can see how we can do that. So uh, we, we, can also, uh, we can also echo the velocity command using the command uh, ROS topic echo turtle one CMD well. And here, as we start moving the robot, we can see the linear velocity and the angular velocity. So linear velocity will allow the, rob the robot to move straight, and the angular velocity will allow the robot to move to rotate uh, whether left all right. And here we can see the ROS topic info. So uh, information about this channel, it uses the twist message. And the twist message has two components, linear velocity and angular velocity. And of course, you can write your own programs. For example, this is a sample program in Python uh, that you can use, for example, for sending velocity commands to any type of robot. And the good thing, the, the same demo that you have seen in the, this very simple simulated robot, you can use it on any sophisticated robot in the same way, in exactly the same way. And this is the strength of Rust. It makes complete abstraction to which robot you are interacting with. So, and this will allow you to easily develop reusable code to use, for example, for robots, for drones, for, for uh, robotic arm, and any kind of robot in a very simple and efficient manner. OK, let me also introduce you the different communication paradigm in uh, Rust. So Ross, the primary communication paradigm is the publisher-subscriber. And in the previous example, we have used the publisher-subscriber mechanism because the teleop was publishing velocity commands, and the robot itself was subscribing to the velocity commands. So as soon as the publisher send messages on the same channel to the subscriber, the subscriber is going to act, is going to consume that message and make the proper action accordingly. OK, we can think also about another node that will be publishing the, uh, the uh, laser scanner data. So laser scanner is going to give you all the data related to obstacles. And uh, the obstacle here will be like an array of distances. 
and every distance will represent the distance to an obstacle at a certain angle. So this node is going to publish this array of distances, and there are two other robots that will consume the uh, information coming from this uh, laser scanner, and then they will implement, for example, a mechanism to avoid obstacles or not to make collide with, uh, with walls and, and, and so on. The second communication paradigm is called DROS services, and here, so in, in this communication paradigm, the publisher will keep sending. So once the connection is established between the publisher and subscriber, uh, in this case, any message that is published by, by the publisher is going to be consumed by the subscriber. We don't need to make any other connection. So the connection is established once. In the ROST services, uh, every time that uh, we have now uh, the concept of a client and the server, so the client in this case need to send a request, and the server will uh, send back a response. And then the whole transaction will be completed. If the client would like to send another request, it has to uh, initiate a new request, and the server will, will just respond back. So it's only uh, uh, one request response operation, and the connection will be stopped. Okay, uh, this is the difference between ROS services and uh, and also publisher and subscriber. The third type is called Action Leap. It's also based on a client server, but uh, the difference is, is that ROS services are uh, synchronous. What does it mean? It means if the client will send a request to the server, it will be blocked. It will be blocked until it receives a response from the th server. If it takes five minutes for the server to process, the client will be blocked for five minutes waiting for a response to happen. So it cannot do anything else. And this may not be uh, affordable in, in, uh, in operations that the server will take a long, of time, uh, long time because the client is going to be uh, just waiting and do nothing, and maybe you'll miss other messages. So this is why Action Lib was defined. So here the client will send, this is completely asynchronous, the client will send a request to the server, and then it can do anything else, because it will not be blocking. And the server will continue the execution, maybe it will take uh, five minutes, 10 minutes, one hour, doesn't matter, okay? Uh, in the meanwhile, while the server is executing the commands, it will send some feedback to the client, and uh, until the work is completely done, and the server in this case will just send the result, whether it has succeeded or it has failed. It will inform the client about the action result at the end. And during all this time, the client can do anything else because this is completely asynchronous and it's not blocking for the client. So these are the main three communication paradigm uh, in robot operating system. And all of this also they applies even to ROS2. Uh, one of the strengths of ROS, it, 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 it defines uh, standard path planning algorithms. And pa uh, actually, path planning and navigation is one of the most, most difficult tasks to do in robotics. So if you don't use ROS, you have to implement all of this from scratch, and it's very complex operation. However, ROS provide you uh, a lot of libraries. For example, this is a library here uh, for SLAM, for building a map. Uh, it works out of the box. It's based on gmapping, on cartographer. Uh, I think now there are maybe three or four SLAM algorithms that are currently supported by ROS. It also allows you to make navigation. Okay, after you build the map, you can let the robot, for example, plan a path and then follow a path automatically. So you have a global path planner and you have a local path planner. So a global path planner will allow you to plan a static path from point A to point B. And the local path planner will allow you to navigate through this path while avoiding obstacles. Because you may plan a path and, for example, there is a person that is crossing this path, so you need to find another alternative short-term route. So this is the local planner that is going to handle this. And uh, it implements uh, it implements a very sophisticated algorithm. So local path planner is based on DWA, and the global path planner is based on DISCRA and also A-STAR algorithms that are supported by uh, ROS. Uh, we have a, a book that is called Robot Path Planning and Cooperation. Uh, where we uh, provide different uh, path planning algorithms and also we provide how to implement path planning algorithms in ROS. So if you have interest into this topic, you can uh, check this book. Okay, so this was uh, the overview of ROS1, but what are the limitations that has led the community to think about another version of ROS2? So first limitation is that ROS1 was developed for single robot applications. Uh, it was not developed for Swarm, it was not developed for collaborative robotics, 
it was divided for single robot applications. And this presents a lot of limitations because if you want to make multiple robots coordinating with each other, you have to develop your own packages and your own uh, ROS packages for, for doing this. There is nothing native for multi-robot communication in ROS1. Also, it doesn't provide real-time guarantees. So all the messages exchanged in the ROS ecosystem are just best effort. They are based on TCP, they are based on UDP, and there is no guarantee that the message will reach. And there is no priority between messages. There is no quality of service profiles. So uh, this is what actually uh, limited the use of ROS in time-critical robotic applications. And also, uh, it, it lacks reliability because basically it's based on UDP. So any message, there is no guarantee that the message will be delivered. Uh, there is the concept of buffering. Uh, so if the buffer is full, uh, the messages that will be coming will be just lost. So there is no uh, reliability defined in uh, ROS1. And also the problem of the ROS master, or what we call the ROS core, it presents a signal, po signal point of failure. So if this particular central node fails, all the ROS ecosystem inside the robot will fail. And this uh, also present another limitation of the ROS1 version. And this is why the community, I think, in started 2013, 2014, to think about an alternative. So the initiative about, about ROS2 has started, uh, if I remember well, in 2014. And the idea was to address the limitation of ROS1. So ROS2 was defined also, it is based on the concept of nodes. But the, 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 one of the main differences, as you can see here, we have ROS master. But ROS master was replaced by something more scalable, which is a middleware for communication between the different nodes. And the middleware that was used here, it was the DDS, Data Distribution Service, which is a known middleware. Uh, it's pretty much old, I think. Uh, it was used in industrial applications. And it was adapted for ROS ecosystem. And I'm going to tell you why DDS was chosen as a middleware. And of course, ROS2 also defined client rivalries. They are not called ROSPI and ROSCPP as in ROS1, but they are called RCLPI and RCLCPP, uh, which is uh, a little bit different. They have different uh, version of C++, uh, of C++ and uh, also different wrapper layer of Python. And the good thing in ROS2, it uses an abstract DDS layer. So what does it mean, abstract DDS? It makes complete abstraction to the current implementation of DDS because DDS, there are different type of vendors. So instead of dealing with a particular vendor or instead of changing these libraries for every particular, uh, every particular vendor of a data distribution service, uh, an abstract DDS layer was developed in order to make abstraction to the implementation. So ROS2 allows you to use different types of DDS implementations without having to uh, we have, without having to care about the implementation, de imp implementation details. Another advantage of ROS2, it is supported by these different platforms, Linux, Windows, and Mac OS. Whereas for ROS, it was primarily supported for Linux operating system. So ROS2 use cases, ROS2 was developed mainly to support swarm of robots. It allows easier uh, interaction between robotic swarm because it's fully distributed. Uh, we don't have the centralized ROS master node but uh, the DDS can communicate with any other DDS in, installed in another robot. It also addressed the limitation of real-time issues in ROS1 by defining what we call QoS profiles. So now you can prioritize, uh, you can prioritize one process over the other, okay, or one thread over the other. Uh, for example, if you want to give more priority, for example, to uh, data coming from a sensor or for example, data that you send to a particular actuator, you can define QS profiles in order to give that priority. So in this case, you can guarantee that some messages are uh, processed with higher priority than other less important messages. And also it allows fast prototyping and uh, faster, uh, faster production. And of course, as already mentioned, it is cross-platform supported by Mac, Windows, and Linux. So, Back in 2015, there was a big discussion about what middleware to choose for uh, ROS2. Uh, so there was two options uh, uh, presented by the community. First option was just to improve the ROS1 transport protocol based on TCP ROS and UDP ROS. And the second option was to build completely new middleware based on existing technology. So after a lot of discussion, the second option was, uh, was considered. And there was a lot of alternative to use, like 0MQ protocol buffer from Google, Zero cough and DDS. And finally, DDS was the option 
that was chosen as a middleware for robot operating system. So why this data distribution service was used? It is uh, an industry standard for communication system. Uh, it is designed by the object management group, and it also uses data-centric publish-subscribe system, exactly like ROS1. So this publish-subscribe mechanism is very compatible to the ROS1 uh, ROS publish-subscribe mechanism. So the integration of DDS with ROS will be very easy to manage. And this is one of the most important uh, criteria why DDS was used. It has also real-time to machine, machine to machine communication, which one of the, so here it will become real-time robot to robot communication because the robot is a machine at the end and uses the publish subscribe pattern similar to ROS. It was used in several previous applications that are time critical and requires a lot of reliability like financial trading, air traffic control, smart grid management, big data and IoT applications. And it's very old, it started in 21 with two vendors, RTI in the US and Thales Group in France. So as already mentioned, the good thing in ROS2, it, it has no vendor lock. You can choose any DDS vendor. There are many, like OpenSlice DDS, RTI, ePROZIMA, and many others. So you can, you can use ROS2 with any of these vendors because of the abstract DDS layer that was defined already in ROS2. And these are the different distributions so far. Uh, so if you want to know more about ROS2, you can go to the official website at docs.ros.org. So the, the two latest versions is ROS Foxy. It was defined in uh, 20, uh, 2020, and it is a long time support. So the support will end in 2023. And the last one is uh, Galactic. It was defined in uh, May 21. It will be supported until November this year. So this one is not is not long time support. This is why you may find that Foxy is going to be much used than this one. Usually in ROS and ROS2, when there is a version, there is a version that is long time support and another intermediate version uh, subsequently, and then the next one will be also long time support. Okay, so I'm done with the introduction of ROS and uh, ROS2. Sorry if I'm a little bit fast because I have many things to present, so I try uh, not to uh, exceed the allocated time. So we've done a lot of contribution at ROS in the previous years. One of the contribution, I've developed several uh, ROS courses that you can find on Udemy. I have more than 17,000 students uh, in my courses. So uh, we have, if you want to start with ROS, this course is comprehensive. It's 14 hour course, ROS for beginners, basic motion and open CV. It, it will provide you all the essentials uh, uh, about robot operating system. And then the second course is the ROS uh, for beginners too, which is about localization, navigation, and SLAM. And these two courses are best sellers now in Udemy. And then also I have another course about ROS2, uh, which presents the essential, uh, essential information about ROS2 and the differences with ROS1. And I have another one, which is ROS for beginners 3, which uh, shows how to build web-based application using ROS Breach to uh, teleoperate robots through web interfaces. So you can find more uh, uh, in these two links about uh, the ROS courses uh, for my ROS courses. And of course, at the end, you will have a certificate similar to this one, like several other students. So in education, I have been enjoying teaching ROS at the university, especially for computer science, stu uh, computer science students without any electrical or mechanical background, because ROS allows uh, them to focus on developing software. So computer science students and software engineering students have enjoyed a robotic course. So this is one application that they have developed in back in 2015, uh, which is a delivery robot that goes to the cafe to bring a coffee, okay, here, uh, and uh, we'll uh, get it back to, to the office. And uh, given the flexibility of ROS and the ease of use, this type of application can be easily done with a simple Python script and C++ scripts as well, uh, programs. This is another uh, student project uh, in another course which uh, has used the LiDAR sensor in order to emulate radar for uh, detection, detecting high speed of the cars. And uh, I can show you here a demo. Okay, so when a car is going to cross in front of the radar, uh, we are going to make speed estimation, okay? And uh, finally, it will uh, check whether the, the car has exceeded particular velocity or not. So this is just an emulation of radar system 
for uh, speed uh, violation detection. Uh, another thing also, uh, in another course, we have used DROS in order to uh, teleoperate uh, a drone. So as I already mentioned to you, if you know ROS, you can use it for any kind of robot, whatever it is, ground robot, uh, aerial robot, uh, robotic arm. So it's everything is based on the same concept. Even for moving a drone, you need to send a twist message, okay, in linear velocity, angular velocity, and the drone is going to act accordingly. And uh, also based on a partnership with uh, our partner in China, uh, we have been working on developing a robot for education. And uh, we have developed for them this website, uh, which pro provides a comprehensive educational content that I've developed for them. It's available on edu.gtech.ha if you want to learn about us uh, from this website as well. Uh, also, we have, I have edited several books in ROS with Springer. Uh, the last one is volume six that was released in 2021. Volume seven is going to be released uh, around June 2022. It's a series of seven books that present comp contributed chapters about latest achievement and advancement in robot operating system. Uh, this is another uh, tutorial that I have developed uh, around 2014, 2015, that shows how to develop a global path planning, uh, which was one of the most difficult things that we have done uh, because develop, developing global path planning was not found with all these details. Uh, so we've done this in order to show all the different steps. In order, if, for example, if you, have, if you have developed a new path planning and you want to test it on a real robot, you can follow this tutorial in order to implement it. The default path planners that are used in ROS are just A star and DISCRA. But of course, maybe some other people can come, come up with better alternatives. They want to test it, compare with existing algorithms so they can actually uh, implement it as a plugin and uh, replace the default planners, global planners, with the custom-made planner. Okay, this is another uh, service robot that we have developed uh, in 2015, 2014 as well. Uh, using mobile app, we can send, uh, uh, we can send, uh, we can send commands to the robot, for example, to navigate from one location to another. Uh, this is again for delivery, okay, as you can see. Uh, but all this work that has been done it was done into uh, a local area network. So I was very much limited by the range of the Wi-Fi router uh, in order to be able to uh, be in the same range with the robot for sending the velocity command. And at that time, I started to think, how can I make all these applications available through the internet? Because at the end, we don't want to have a limited scale. Of course, you can have multiple Wi-Fi routers and so on, but this is going to make very big complexity in the deployment. We want something like uh, uh, seamless interaction, very easy to use. You can use it anywhere, anytime, without having to be in the same range of the robot. Maybe you want to teleoperate a robot from your house. You want to, to, to teleoperate a robot from another country, uh, from another continent. So we need to have something really through the internet. And we start to think about uh, finding a solution. And this has led us to, uh, to, f to, to develop what we call the Rustling Protocol which is based on the following architecture that I'm going to use in my second part of this presentation. So as I already mentioned to you, this, uh, this project uh, done in 2013 has led us to think about how we can uh, develop the same application, but uh, being able to send all these commands from, uh, from any, from any uh, distance to the robot without being confined to limited Wi-Fi range over here. And uh, so uh, f this, this actually led us to investigate more the concept about cloud robotics, which has started back in 2010. So the first work about cloud robotics started in 2010. And basically, uh, if you look at cloud robotics, you, we can categorize them into two main categories. The first category is the virtualization of robotic system, which allows you to seamlessly access robots through services interface, for example, through a mobile web interface or through web interfaces. Uh, or software APIs. And the second, uh, the second usage of cloud robotics is to offload computation. Uh, so what does it mean? Uh, basically, robots are battery, uh, battery powered and they have limited processing capabilities. So if you want to process, uh, for example, deep learning algorithms, machine learning algorithms on board, some of the robots are not able to do that, okay? Because they don't have enough power and they don't have enough energy or enough processing 
capabilities. So in this case, we will offload extensive computation, like for example, AI algorithms or computer vision algorithms, we will offload them to the cloud. Instead of processing them locally, we will send the image to the cloud. The cloud is going to process the image and finally send the result back to, to the robot. This is called the concept of computation uploading. There are plenty, plenty of papers around these two categories. And if you want to have more information about the topics, you can see my uh, a chapter in the encyclopedia of robot is called service oriented robotic computing and uh, it presents in detail uh, a comprehensive literature review about virtualization of robotic system and computation of loading of robotic systems so the two main work that have inspired me it's uh, one is called uh, the robot earth uh, it's a project it's a european project back in 2011 2013 and later on, it has been promoted to a company. Now, there is a company that calls Raputa Robotic, and Raputa basically is one of the outcomes of the Robot Earth project. And uh, this project, actually, they made uh, a collaborative framework for uh, many robots through the cloud. Okay, so there is a knowledge base in the cloud, and this knowledge base will share information among all the robots that are operating in a particular environment. Uh, this is one of the pioneer work in computation of loading. Another pioneer work from the perspective of uh, uh, virtualization of robot is called the Ross Bridge, which was defined 2010, 2011. And here it allows to define web, web interfaces uh, to uh, the robot. So Ross Bridge, it's a server that is installed on the robot and will allow to communicate with uh, uh, a web browser through web sockets. And they will exchange JSON messages. So here you can define a JavaScript application that will send velocity commands to the robot through the ROS bridge, the ROS bridge interface. But here, uh, so we were thinking about using ROS bridge, but actually it doesn't mean our requirement for a simple reason that the ROS bridge server is implemented in the robot. So what is the limitation here? It means if you want to communicate with the robot, you must know the IP address of the robot. So this is possible if you, if you look in the local area network, but if you work through the internet, not every robot on the internet has a public IP address. Of course, you can use, for example, uh, NAT, uh, which is the translation, a network address translation. But you know, this is going to add additional complexity in order uh, to, uh, to, to operate directly with a robot having a public IP address. So for this reason, we uh, tried to think something different. And our idea was actually to use a cloud. And the cloud will have a public IP address. And uh, we have the robots and drones on the other side. So one of the objective of the cloud is to offload the computation, heavy computation. So if the robot or the drone are not able to process heavy computation like deep learning algorithms on board, we will offload this computation to the cloud in order to process heavy computation on the cloud and then send back the result back to the drone and the robot. And the second objective is to be able to interact with the robot and the drone through web and mobile interfaces. So the cloud will be like a proxy will be a mediator between the end users interacting through web interfaces and between the robots uh, that will be executing the request of the users. And for this, we wanted to leverage the use of cloud computing and IoT in order to make this happen. So I was inspired by the Mavlink protocol when I wanted to design Roslink because Mavlink, it was a protocol uh, for uh, Ardu pilot and uh, PX4 systems that allows the communication between a drone or between a robot and uh, a mobile app. But here, the Mavlink uh, was, uh, was not supported by ROS. Uh, of course, there is the MAFROS that supports Mavlink, but uh, we want to make something uh, completely, uh, fully compatible with ROS. And uh, the Mavlink protocol uses here uh, binary serialization, uh, whereas in ROSLink, we have used JSON-based serialization. And uh, first of all, we have developed the drone map architecture, which is the general framework of the Roslink protocol. So here we have three layers. We have the application or the user layer here. We have the, the drone and the robot layer, and here we have the cloud layer. So of course, the robot, it, it has hardware and the, it has the ROS layer, and then we define all different type of web services, cloud interfaces, and applications on top of ROS. Uh, same thing for the user layer and the cloud will provide all different tools for computation of loading and also for the seamless interaction between the drone and robots and also the end users. OK, so the idea of the internet of drone and users uh, and the uh, internet of drones and robots is to connect drone and robots through the internet. 
is to access them virtually and also offload computation, as an example, deep learning. And uh, two communication approaches, so either we use the MapLink protocol or we can use also the ROSLink protocol. So both of them were uh, supported by the drone map architecture that we have developed initially. Now, let me explain the problem of ROS. So, uh, the ROS, as already mentioned, it, it, it suffers from the problem of the single robot problem. So, every robot has its own ROS master. Okay? And this actually makes that if a robot would like to communicate with users, both the, the user and the robot has to communicate through the same ROS master. So, there is no communication between these robots altogether or between these robots and other users altogether. One possible uh, one possible solution will be to put one ROS master into a cloud and then let all the users and all the robots connect through this ROS master and we can use his prefix for the robots and the users in order for the ROS to effectively dispatch all the messages between every robot and its proper user. But this technique is not scalable because again you will have the single point of failure and also uh, ROS master will have difficulty to manage different type of robots with different topic names, with different prefixes. Okay, it will not work for a large number of robots if, if we want to use thousands of robots or tens of thousands of robots, that will not be possible at all. So this is why we thought about ROSLink. And the idea of ROSLink is to use here uh, a cloud as a proxy, which implement the ROSLink protocol. And then you have different robots. Every robot will have its own ROS and ROS master. Okay, but we are going to implement another layer that is called the bridge, the ROSLink bridge, and the ROSLink bridge will have access to all the topics, all the nodes in the ROS, and then we'll send JSON, mess JSON messages, okay, for any information that we collect here. We can send position message, we can send twist message, we can send uh, any kind of information that we want through a very simple uh, message structure that is called the ROSLink message, and will be processed by the cloud. The cloud will have different type of communication interfaces that will allow to receive the message, process them, and dispatch them to any user. So in this case, I can choose, so the cloud can choose which robot to dispatch to which user in a very seamless and very affordable way. So we implemented this architecture, and this is more detailed architecture here. So the Roslink cloud will have a cloud architecture for computation of loading. It will have a proxy layer, and the proxy layer uh, it is an intermediate between the robot and the user. So we have a ROSLink bridge in every robot. We have a ROSLink client in every user application. And the ROSLink, uh, ROSLink bridge and the ROSLink client will connect through the ROSLink proxy in order to exchange messages. So any information that I want from ROS, it will be captured by ROSLink bridge, will be sent to the ROSLink proxy, and the ROSLink proxy will send it to the client. And any comment that we want to get from the client, for example, I want to send velocity command, it will be sent to the ROSLink proxy, and the ROSLink proxy will send it to the ROSLink bridge, and the ROSLink bridge basically will transfer it to ROS in order to execute that command. And this will make the communication between the robot and the user very, very easy to manage. So in ROSLink communication protocol, we support different uh, communication protocols. We have TCP IP, we support UDP, we support also WebSockets, and recently, we developed another, another version, which is not public, uh, RabbitMQ. So now we have a second version of, uh, of ROSLink, which is uh, uh, more developed for industrial use case and commercial use case. But this version is already open source. It's available on GitHub, and it's based on TCP, UDP, and WebSocket. Everybody can uh, use this version. So this gives enough flexibility to the developer to choose most appropriate transport protocol for his application. And the ROSLink is based on a particular message structure uh, that is defined by the ROSLink version because we have different type of ROSLink version. Uh, the ROS version that is run on the robot, uh, the system ID, this identifies the robot or the user. So every robot has a single and unique system ID. The message ID, it can be, for example, the heart rate or the global message of the robot, global position message or uh, laser message. So the message ID will identify what is the payload that is being carried here. And uh, also a sequence number to count how many packets are sent per message. So this is an example of a message structure, uh, the heartbeat message. So the heartbeat message is, call, is called the presence message. It is sent every second. 
by the robot to uh, tell about its presence, that it is alive and it is connected to uh, the cloud. So this message is sent periodically every second uh, for the robot to uh, advertise its presence. And it contains, as you can see, Yeah, yeah. Okay. Uh, okay, just let me jump to uh, the demos that we have developed. Okay, just two minutes. Okay, so we have developed, uh, yeah, Roslink protocol was developed on uh, a 5G robot navigation. So we have used this demo for Huawei uh, in the inauguration of the STC uh, 5G lab. Uh, this is a delivery robot that is operated over 5G networks and we can observe in real time the position of the robot as it moves. We can also observe in real time the, uh, the video feed coming from the robot. And because we are in 5G network, we can reach up to 20 frames per second, which is, uh, very, uh, which is high frequency for uh, with the video stream. Uh, another one uh, for computation of loading. This is one of the early prototypes that we have used. Uh, so here, uh, the background image that you can see, it's the image that is running on the cloud. Uh, so the images are sent from the drone to the cloud and the clone will run a YOLO algorithm in order to detect the different objects that it can see in the environment, as you can see. So it can detect a person, table, chairs, and so on. And finally, uh, in December 2021, we have developed a complete framework for autonomous drone delivery system using Roslink. Uh, so here, uh, this is our uh, drone for delivery. We can send commands through the Roslink protocol to the drone uh, through mobile app. Uh, through 5G, 4G networks, and the drone is going to execute the mission and uh, make the delivery of a package from one location to another, as you can see uh, over here. Now we are cur uh, currently working on the extension of Frostlink uh, to include uh, security functions and to be more scalable as well. Sorry if I have been long, and thank you for watching. Thank you so much, uh, Dr. Anis. Uh, I, have a, I have a doubt uh, with regard to ROS. Uh, I'm also having uh, IoT lab here in Dutan University, and uh, we are working on autonomous vehicles. So can you guide me that, uh, can we install this ROS on Raspberry Pi or even on NVIDIA Jetson Nano? Do they support that? Yes, sure, uh, you can install this. There are, uh, there are several images for uh, Raspberry Pi, but you know, I don't, I don't really advise Raspberry Pi. Maybe Raspberry Pi 4 is sufficient, has sufficient power to work with Rust. Uh, but usually uh, Raspberry Pi is very limited, although it is used in TurtleBot 3, but I would recommend to use Jetson boards. With Jetson boards, it's uh, excellent. Jetson Nano works fine. Jetson Xavier NX is better, and Xavier XGX is almost perfect to run complete ROS ecosystem. Yes. And sir, I want to ask you the second question, that uh, do you think that uh, the ROS is better as compared to the NVIDIA SDKs that are used for advanced computer vision and even for their... Uh, Jetson-based robotics and drones-based libraries? Yeah, I have heard about uh, NVDA, like a robotic framework. Uh, honestly, I didn't investigate this a lot. But, you know, uh, you know, something for NVIDIA is going to be for NVIDIA. But trust, it's kind of universal. Okay, you can use it on any kind of uh, computer. You can use it. Uh, it's very, very flexible, very versatile. You can uh, use it uh, for any kind of robots. Uh, you can customize it the way that we want because it's based on open source libraries uh, that can uh, provide you any kind of functionality that you need. And one more suggestion which I would like to tell you, as you were telling about the problem that your sensors are having limited Wi-Fi and other things, so why don't you use LoRaWAN? Uh, because LoRaWAN we are also using and we are doing projects with agriculture and other things, and we are putting up tons of sensors on agriculture fields, and we are connecting to one single gateway to expect... Yes. Yes, uh, the, and yeah, even yeah. long range communications is even. Yeah, thank you very much. Yes, that's uh, interesting. But you know, the problem with Flora, uh, f f at least for the use cases that I'm working with, two problems. First of all, it still have a limited range. Even it can reach 20 kilometers. But sometimes maybe I want to teleoperate a robot from another country. You know, I'm not limited uh, to a particular scale. And another thing. Of 55 to 70 kilometers, we are actually working for 45 to 65 kilometers. Yeah, but with 5G network, I can teleoperate even thousands of kilometers. I don't, doesn't matter. You know, one of the one of the demo that I've done uh, once from Saudi Arabia, I just uh, took off a drone in China, just by connected to yeah. So uh, it's pretty much simple, and you can see in real time where the drone is is uh, is flying. You, you can track it on Google Map in very easy manner. 
So with 5G, you don't have any limitation as, as long as you have internet connection. And another thing with LoRa is that it's uh, very low uh, bandwidth. And uh, usually in robotic application, we want to send video streams, we want to send like continuous stream of data. So LoRa bandwidth is not going to be sufficient for these kind of applications. Thank you so much, sir. And soon I will be contacting you for some MOU with my lab and your lab. Sure. Soon I will be very, very glad. I will be very, very glad. glad. Thank you.